welcome to the first video podcast version of my new music box uh, column. And today is a very special uh, occurrence because uh, over the past year and a half, we have been seeing the emergence of uh, a new breed of new music enthusiasts who have been uh, working in both video and audio um, based up in in Wisconsin, or Wisconsin, God Lord, shoot me now, uh, in Michigan, uh, originally based in Michigan State University, but now kind of scattered throughout the globe. Um, we have the Sound Notion folk at soundnotion.tv, and and today I'm going to be interviewing them. They've interviewed me interviewed me three times, and so now I get to turn the tables. And so I thought I might just. Go around the table and have each one of you introduce yourselves and tell us um, what you're doing now, and then we'll talk about how you guys got together. So this is going to be a trick because normally we plan how uh, the order in which we go around. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I'm Dave McDonald, and right now I am uh, living in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm an adjunct uh, at Grand Valley State University, and I am roommates with this fine gentleman over here. Nate Blyton. Hi. <laughs> Nate, do you want to introduce? Well, my name's Nate Blyton, and uh, I, uh, yeah, I was a composition student with all these folks at Michigan State University. I also live in Grand Rapids, as Dave and I are in the same room, and so that's where we are. Proof. Yeah. I work out at Grand Valley State University. I am the equipment and stage manager for their music and dance department. And <laughs> which is a confusing role, but I do a lot of things for them, and it's really fun. Excellent. Who's next? I'll go next. <laughs> so I'm Patrick Gulo. Uh, I also went to Michigan State University with these fine folks, as uh, as uh, Nate put it earlier. Um, I got my master's there, then booked it off to New York City, where I've been doing publicity for classical musicians ever since. And who are you working for out there? Right now, I'm a public relations associate at Kirschbaum, Demmler, and Associates. Excellent. And uh, I'm Sam Mercier's. I am. Uh, I don't have yet my doctorate in music composition. I'm letting it cure for a while before I take it out of the smoke. <laughs> like a fine bourbon. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but know these guys. Um, from not just Michigan State, but from lots of artistic uh, collaborative enterprises that hopefully we'll get into a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, currently, I'm uh, seeking uh, you know artistic enrichment in film projects and uh, doing the podcast. But to make money, I work at Meridian Winds in Okemos, Michigan, right near the Michigan State campus, fixing saxophones. And it's one of the best repair band instrument repair shops in the Midwest. Awesome. And I say that not just because I work there. Plug, plug, plug. Exactly. Well, I thought it might not be a bad idea for y'all to maybe tell us a bit about how this, uh, how this endeavor got started. Because there's really nothing else like it out there. And, and uh, especially since the fact that all four of you started it um, while you were in grad school. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty mean feat, the fact that it's still going after a year and a half. So how did, how did you guys... Figure out that that something like this uh, would be feasible. Go, Dave. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess um, we kind of always enjoyed having these conversations amongst ourselves. I, a lot of the things that we talk about on the show, we have talked about for years amongst each other at the bar or you know after class or whatever. And uh, we had, I mean, I had been a fan of podcasts for a long time. I know Patrick listened to a lot of podcasts as well. And for a long time, I had wanted to start a podcast, but I couldn't think of anything that I actually knew enough about to start a podcast. And then it occurred to me that I was a very expensively trained composer and that I could probably do a podcast about new music if I could find some interesting folks to do it with. And these guys uh, were some of my favorite people to just talk to and have good conversations with. Um, and so I thought, you know, if, if, if we enjoyed doing this, maybe some other people might enjoy listening to the things uh, that we have. Also, you know, we, we kind of saw that there was a lack of this 
kind of resource. Like this was the sort of podcast that we would have listened to or watched if it had existed before we created it. Um, so one of the reasons we created it was just because it's something that we wanted to get into and learn about um, all this, the the new music and music news, as Patrick says each week. Tagline. I came up with that, by the way. Let's let's everyone know that. Let's know it. Patrick has all the good ideas in this operation. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning that. Um, I think the the nucleus of the idea of making a podcast came from Dave and Patrick, just because they either had you know how school works out. You have lunch with someone a whole semester, and you end up collaborating with them in some way because of that, or you have a class with someone. So and then have lunch I, after. I, yeah, I don't know what you guys were doing, but you and Patrick are both watching a lot of, uh, or either absorbing in some way, a lot of tech blogs or tech podcasts. And I've always been a huge fan of uh, um, Radio Lab, just because it's so stylishly executed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, basically, they came up with the idea, and then I was asked to come in, just because I've done a lot of stuff with the guys in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, this basic conglomeration of people have done, we've done a new music uh, series at a local gallery. Uh, we entered the 48 hour film contest in Detroit. Uh, you know, just lots of, had a, an indie band you know, thing. And one of those kind of what kind of music is that bands that it's, perform in bars. It's electronic folk, you know, with a little bit of rock in there. Yeah. Right. It, it started and, and think, laptop. Yeah. Right. I think the idea for the podcast really started um, during breakfast one morning, Dave, wasn't it? It was. Was it? <laughs> we were just sitting. We were just sitting down and we're like, let's do this. <laughs> and we figured out all the logistics. It must have been like December of 2010 or something. We started our first episodes in January the next year. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and we've been doing one a week ever since. We should say that at the beginning, we were all, since we were all at MSU, we were all sitting around a table in one room. Yep. And every week, we would truck in a bunch of gear, some from home and some we kind of borrowed from the department, and uh, set it all up, and it all ran on my laptop. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we figured out how to get Skype, how to Skype people in. Um, we wanted to have guests from off campus, and then when we all graduated and moved out, we had to figure out how to do it uh, another way, and we, we have been using uh, Skype group video chat, which is what we're using right now, uh, to do these. And that it's, and it's way easier. It's way easier because <laughs> we don't have to set up and tear down each week. Schlep is the word you're looking for, Dave. Right. And this, sh- I don't know if you can see in the wide, we've got a bunch of business going on here. Yeah. And we've Imagine setting all that crap up once a week and then tearing it all down. Yeah, that's what we were doing. Mm-hmm. Right. That's right. Because the first few shows that you guys did, you didn't have guests, right? It was just the four of you talking about the different news items that happened to have been popping up, popping up every week. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, we we tried early on to get a guest um, that was featured in a story that we found in the New York Times. That was Mirna Shim. So there was a, a no. It was not the New York Times. It was San Francisco Chronicle, I think. But that's not really so important. Uh, Chloe Veltman had written a story about Mirna Shim and her Kickstarter campaign, and we thought that was really cool because we liked new media and Web 2.0 things and crowdsourcing and crowdfunding and all those hip buzzwords about the web. Right. And uh, so we thought, hey, we should get this person on that did this thing. Um, I don't know who she is, but maybe we can find her email address. And uh, I think we we got a hold of her on Twitter or Facebook. I don't know. I think Patrick, you were the one that did that, right? Yeah, I think. I think we I think technically had a guest. Twitter. We technically had a guest before that. We had a guest panelist fill in. We had Jeff uh, Dive. Oh, uh, that's true. Uh, so anyway, we, we figured out so, per- pretty early on that we could get some some interesting people on if we just asked. And then after we did that a few times, we it occurred to us that the most interesting shows for us and i think probably for other people were when we had guests on so we try as often as possible to have a guest we don't always get it done um but we usually do we've been going uh maybe a couple of months with a guest every week we we don't have one scheduled for this week though so that might be our end of our street (laughs) sure did you get my email yes (laughs) thanks for clearing that up sam (laughs) well i was gonna say i mean in terms of guests uh, you know, the fact, I mean, just, just seeing who some of the guests you, you folks have had, 
just in the past month, six weeks, eight weeks. I mean, yeah, I'm. I don't know how you're 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 pulling all these big names in, but you must be doing something right. How do you connect with all these folks, and what do you have to do to bribe them to show up on a Sunday morning? First of all, I'm insulted that you think we need to bribe people to come on the show. <laughs> also, uh, it's just. Uh, and but you must. You're acting on bad information because we don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> so well. Sam, I think you should answer this one because you're you're the one that's been um, getting these guests for us the last couple of months. All all of our sweet bookings the last couple of months uh, with uh, actually almost all of our sweet bookings for the last couple of months have been Sam. Uh, Jeremy Dank was a Patrick Gulo project. Nice. Yeah. Um, but Sam, I think why don't you talk about what what you do? Well, I just. Like, for instance, uh, I haven't heard back from her, but Anne Majette has agreed to come on the show at some point. Scheduling is kind of a problem. And I we have featured her pieces on the show a lot. And I'm like, well, let's just send her an email. So I came up with some sort of boilerplate text for an email that you shape for each person, you know. And uh, it's amazing how when you you send an email and you act like, you know, you act like you're something to talk about. People treat you like you're something to talk about. <laughs> And they agree to come on the show. That's really the whole story. Um, Don't give away the press secrets. <laughs> it's it's actually been amazing. And we all comment on it every time we have a great guest. Um, and that's great as in they're a big name and we know it's going to be a big guest because it's a big name or someone that we haven't necessarily heard of. But they end up being this super genius person who ha inspires great conversation. We just can't believe we get these people on the show. And it seems like all you got to do is ask, you know. Yep. Um, we, we we haven't gone for a <clears throat> a top tier composer yet, and I, uh, and I know it's shocking to you that we can find composers who want to sit around and talk about themselves <laughs> talk, for an hour. Not at all. Um, not at all. Well, and 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 well, you you just said not uh, not having a top tier composer, but I mean, you just had Augusta Reed Thomas yeah. on a couple. Yeah, weeks what ago. are you talking about, Mercedes? I mean, <laughs> geez, that, I mean we're we're getting we're getting pretty close to the top. There. <laughs> well, like, like, when Dave and I were talking about that, we said I can't believe we're getting Augusta Reed Thomas on, and no no offense against her, uh, she is a top tier, but like as far as like publicity and and sort of like general public knowledge of a person, you know, right. like. We yeah. got Augusta Reed Thomas. The next step, I mean, if you want to go above her, you've got to get somebody like Philip Glass or Steve Reich or John Adams that's yeah. more known in the sort of general public. And and much more difficult to get a hold of because right. they have they layers have of publicity and, and people that you have to deal with. Um, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, just the fact that you guys had Jeremy Dink one week and, and Augusta Reed Thomas the next week um, – and then Drew McManus, three weeks in a row, and completely different, you know, a performer and a composer and then someone in, in the industry. Uh, it really shows that you're thinking not just in one small slice of, of the musical world, but kind of a nice holistic aspect of it. Yeah, we, we say new music and music news, but we end up covering a lot more than that. We end up talking a lot about classical music a little bit more generally. Um, because a lot of it impacts new music, and mm -hmm. a lot of times it's it's just as interesting for us to talk about. It's we could just as as well call this show things that we think would be fun to talk about this week <laughs> is the tagline. <laughs> um, for as much as we stick to our new music and music news, right? Yeah, um, I think uh, one of the key things for me about the show up till now has been how educational it's been for me. Mm -hmm. so you think yeah. well, you've got all these expensive degrees in composition. Certainly I know how to talk about new music and, and, you know, I can express opinion on a new music box blog post or something like that, but right. I didn't realize how much there was to know about what's out there. Like the indie music scene, I've learned a ton about since we started the show, just because, you know, I needed to. Yeah. And, and it's not, and it's not academic life. Yeah. The, my fluency of being able to name composers and know who's getting performances right now and all that kind of stuff that you'd expect, like if I were trying to get a job working in a composition area, right? the kind of thing you'd expect that person to know, I am way more, I am way more bootstrapped in that knowledge now than I ever was before, yep. and it's because of doing this show. Um, I, I know exactly what you guys are talking about because, I mean, several years ago I had a radio show I, that on – on like an NPR station down in Oklahoma, and I was in the same position. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And you just do it, and you learn, 
And actually, now that I think about it, you guys started in January of 2011, right? Yes. That was the first episode we published. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the first month that I started writing for New Music Box. Ah, wow. So, you know, we, and, and again, it's, it's the same thing uh, that you just kind of learn by doing. And the, uh, whatever the project is, tends to, to uh, at least from my, from my vantage point, it, it seems to evolve as you go along. I would have never known that I would have been writing about the stuff that I've been writing about this year if you had asked me 12 months ago or 18 months ago. And I'm quite sure you guys have probably, you know, are in the same position. Right. Yeah. Oh, without a doubt. Speaking of which, I really enjoyed reading your your Sibelius piece this last oh, week. Oh, that nice. was really great. That was fun, <laughs> especially with the with the idea of of emailing like fifty plus composers. Yeah. On Thursday morning and go. All right, who's going to answer yeah. by Thursday night so I can write this thing? <laughs> uh, and actually, a, an amazing amount of composers, like you say, you just email them and see what they say, and yeah. incredibly, yeah. they will put it out there. When yeah. we first started asking people to be on the show, I mean, I was a little apprehensive about like, oh, geez, it's just, you know, kind of cold calls to you know, some some big names in the industry. And then, you know, you kind of get used to just people saying, hey, I can I can be on the show this day or I can't do it or something. I mean, musicians, they, they love to talk and they're willing to be on the show or do anything to really get their opinions out there if they're if they have them. Now, let me ask how do you have a do you have a sense in terms of of uh, how many people either download your your audio podcast or watch the <laughs> video podcast each week? Uh, it's a it's not it's not very many. We're trying all the time to get more. It's a few hundred, right? Um, we would like to get uh maybe a few thousand in in some time, but th I th I'm happy with where where we're going. Mm -hmm. right. It's continuing to grow. That's from like downloading the podcast. Dave? Yeah, that counts. That counts everything. <laughs> okay, all right. Now, what, so, what, I mean, what are some of the challenges that you see in terms of this particular medium? Because it is a little different than just writing a blog or or uh, putting something in print. Hmm. It's a well taking the whole market. <laughs> you know, it's pretty small. Right. People who are interested in quote new music, whatever you think that is, is. A, you know, if they understand what we mean by new music, I guess it's a pretty small, small group of people. Mm -hmm. And I think probably in that group, there is a large subset that would never engage with a podcast because, I mean, you know, a lot of composers are very tech savvy, especially younger ones. And it seems to be getting that way more, more and more all the time. But right. we all know that there are a lot of, uh, you know, let's say well-established people in music academia and new music circles who don't care anything about technology or podcasting or anything else. So I think there's a large group of people that, that we don't have, and I don't think we're going to get Yeah, those people. Yeah. And it also takes a lot for, even for someone who might be interested, it takes a lot for someone to press a play button right. online. I mean, they see a video, it's just like, uh, and they see the timer, you know, if an, if an episode is an hour long or something, some people might just be like, nah, whatever. Right. <laughs> Not right now, maybe later. And that's that's a challenge that's unique. You know, we talked earlier about the fact that, that uh, Patrick and I have enjoyed tech podcasts for a while. And that's a, a very different thing because the people that are interested in tech podcasts are people that are interested in technological things like podcasts. Uh, right, right. So we, <laughs> we have to, to work a little harder to find an audience for this that, is also uh, podcast savvy people, and like Sam said, that's not everybody that's interested in our content. Yeah. Honestly, right. for myself, this has actually been like I I was not participating in the podcasting world at all before doing this podcast. I started listening to podcasts after being exposed to podcasts through doing this one, and then through just talking about it with these folks and everything. And I. Uh, I kind of got into this project for just from doing a bit with audio and being their friend and being a musician and everything. And, and, and so this has been a whole new experience for me in a lot of ways. And I, I'm one of, <laughs> yeah, before this whole project started, I was definitely one of those people that didn't participate in, pro in podcast world at all. And Nate's a techie dude. So right. there's probably a lot of people like Nate. Well, before I forget, uh, why don't you tell the folks who are listening and possibly, 
uh, reading. I'm not sure if I'm going to transcribe this or not. I kind of like the idea of forcing folks to actually watch the video. Um, Fun. Because that's kind of what the whole point of this is. Mm-hmm. Um, is is how, what are the different ways that they can view it? Uh, because I know you, you both have it on your site, but then you also have it on YouTube. And can they down, what, how, how can they get a hold of, of the uh, podcasts or view them? So we, we tried to make our stuff available in as many places as possible without killing ourselves to upload it to every website that has video content on the web. So you can watch us on YouTube. You can stream us just kind of like YouTube in an embedded web page player on our site, townocean.tv. Mm-hmm. Um, on there, you can also download the audio. You can download the video and there's an audio player there as well. And all of our shows are on the iTunes store. So you can subscribe to them as podcasts. And if you're not an iTunes person, you can subscribe to them uh, normally the way you normally subscribe to podcasts with our feeds on the site. So again, it's soundnotion.tv. And we've got three shows right now uh, that we have this show, Sound Notion, that's every week. We have our these, flagship program. Our flagship program. Thank you, Sam. For the network. Yeah. Uh, and that, is, and then we also have uh, an audio-only show called "Music Is Hard" that's every week, and then uh, "Streamers and Punches," which is a film music show um, that's just started doing their shows monthly now, um, and that's that's every month, and that's video. Awesome. So basically, you can you you can we put it on YouTube because people, when people do this all the time, people use our video content to embed in their blog or right. Whatever. So that lets people do that by putting it on YouTube, and we nice. begrudge them not for doing so. Yes, we, we release all our shows under a Creative Commons license, so anybody who wants to do anything with our content is more than welcome to. Now, yeah. was, there any, was there any particular reason why you guys decided to go with the hour-plus format rather than something that you could do in a little bit more bite-sized chunks? That was a, a big topic of... No, we we were we were going back and forth in the, for for a long time. I, I remember even even recently, probably within the past year, we considered cutting the show down a little bit. We didn't know if maybe the length of the program was affecting our viewership. It's certainly um, a big issue for video. Yeah, yeah. Because that video. long video file is a big dang file. Um. So yeah, that's that's definitely something that we talked about, but. You know, Patrick. I don't know about you, but certainly the, sh- the the shows that I listened to and watched before we started the show were all around the same length as ours. Yeah, certainly. It does. I mean, even I mean, like Twit is an hour and a half typically. Mm-hmm. Um, which Leo, he's our he's our Twit hero. Twit is basically. this week in tech and it's run by uh, a guy named Leo Laporte. If you remember, back in the days of tech TV or ZDTV, mm-hmm. he was one of the hosts there, and he, after that got shut down, started his podcast network. And, and we were totally vibing his style big time. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> on this show. So if you watch Twit, it'll go, oh, that looks a lot like, you know, if they were making fun <laughs> of, uh, you know, Nico Muley's tweeting style right now, this would be Sound Notion. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Sam has been called the shock jock of Sound Notion. By friend of the show, Marinay Shim. Shock, shock jock of new music in general. Oh, saying. perhaps. <laughs> That's I right. was going to say, like I, like I mentioned before, there's really nobody else out there who's doing something like this, where especially the fact that you guys are doing it on a Sunday morning mm-hmm. uh, with all of the other Sunday morning you know, roundtable news shows, the fact that you decided <laughs> to do that uh, for new music, uh, you know, it, it's nice. It fills a little void, and, yeah. and it gives. I think it gives... Uh, folks a different aspect of it and especially the fact that you all are from michigan and not from manhattan or brooklyn (laughs) or or something like that uh what kind of either what kind of comments have you heard or what kind of feedback have you gotten because of the fact that uh you are bringing a midwestern uh viewpoint to these uh different subjects that you guys discuss Mm. sam I that would say like a Sam thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that we haven't gotten a lot of unsolicited comments. We mm-hmm. have addressed the idea of new music is bigger than New York. You know what I mean? Right. Um, several times on the show, and we've gotten some really some some thoughtful engagement from the guests when we take take up that point. 
And we've had some response by people uh, saying, you know, that's a way to stand up for the third coast or whatever, you know, those kinds of ideas. And I'm, you know, it's, it's interesting. The show works, I think, personality wise, because everybody kind of has their own axe to grind Mm -hmm. in a way. Um, Dave is very tech savvy, uh, and he understands a lot of things. And I just, you know, I know Dave is going to talk about certain things and I don't have to be that knowledgeable. And I'm always about talking about music education and, you know, how is this helping the community and this kind of thing. And Patrick is always thinking like a publicist and, you know, mm-hmm. and, and always getting down on me and Dave for not thinking for, for, uh, not liking music because it's too pretty. Uh-huh. And uh, and then Nate Nate is the is the best to have around because he doesn't talk a huge amount, but whenever there's something that's a Nate topic, you know he knows. <laughs> Nate, you got to lays know, it out for us. You gotta, <laughs> <laughs> but Nate is very knowledgeable about certain things. It like it's and, and notably, he's mentality. knowledgeable in a lot of areas which we are not. That's yeah. right. So it's good that he, he he's just like the dark horse candidate who will come up with he'll talk about something you're like and and it always is a refreshing uh you know breath of fresh air uh, in a in in a topic when Nate pipes in with something and he always has a different perspective. So. The strong silent type. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. right. You know you know Rob actually you 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 mentioned uh the other Sunday morning shows and yeah. that's actually some one thing I forgot to mention when you ask how people can uh, it, it participated in our show. We actually do stream Sound Notion. We don't stream all our shows live, but we stream. We we make an effort to stream Sound Notion live every Sunday. Uh, and so if anybody wants to watch that, they can go to soundnotion.tv slash live, and there's a chat room there, uh, and we will uh, take requests, as it were, from the chat room. So if you've mm-hmm. got an a- if you've got an axe to grind that's different from any of our axes, uh, we would love for you to share your opinion. You can be a part of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Someday uh, in the future, you might want to, you know, add in a call-in feature to your show. So we would love in. to. That's that is a technological barrier that is just one step too far for us at the moment. We, yeah, but that sounds like a lot of fun. So you're an organization that provides money to arts organizations or podcasts. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um. So so why don't you tell me a little bit in terms of how do you put together. A weekly show like mm. what what do you do what do you have to do to organize a show from week to week the to magic week? of google it's all about the doc Back. yeah <laughs> google docs have uh <laughs> revolutionized the way we are able to collaborate with one another and that's we started using google docs long before the, uh so i guess it was sam that mentioned all the different projects that some version of the the four of us have worked on over the last three or four years yeah um and we use google docs for almost all of them uh to to collaborate and i don't know if, if you haven't used google docs it's an amazing tool it let, <laughs> you can all edit the same it's, it's basically a word doc a word processor file at the same time in the cloud and you can watch what each person's typing as they go so every single week we set up one doc for the episode and we call that the episode doc um and it's just got we have kind of basically a template and anytime anybody finds a story that they think would be cool that was published in the last week or so uh to talk about on the show they add a line in the doc and say hey here's a link here's a very brief description of it um and then sunday morning we all get up and read them all some of us read them the night before, even. <laughs> some, of, some of us read them as the week goes along, I guess. Right. Uh, when it's, when but, it's finals week, however, um, we get yeah. up on Sunday morning. Sam gets up at like 6 a.m. because there's only one story in the dock, and he scours <laughs> the computer for three hours and finds a bunch of stories and puts them in the dock. And we're like, oh, what the hell happened this week? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's easier than others. Some weeks it's oh, kind sure. of a struggle, as, as I'm sure you know from, from writing in new music box. Yeah. Sometimes oh, yeah. it's real easy, and sometimes you really have to dig. Um, yeah, like, like the whole, uh, the, the whole, you know, the Met kerfuffle recently has been like gold to us. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Pulling, yeah. pulling a gelb. That's that's a Sam. Pulling Re- a gelb. Re- that's right. That's Sam Re- Sears trademark. Ping. That uh, means uh, that means a huge public relations gaffe. That's pulling a gelb. So we we have a, a list of sources that we check regularly. You know, we check a lot of the big newspapers. We check. We have a big list. I have a big list of blogs that I read every single day, um, and uh, you know we we look at Twitter. Sam is is the one that's checking Twitter more than anybody, I think. Um, but 
we we look for for anything anywhere. And and I have a, a hint for the viewers, and I'm gonna want to see if this has any impact. If anybody has a suggestion for a story, um, they can tweet it, um, and put a, a, at Sound Notion in there, and then put the hashtag uh, S N Weekly. Weekly. I've been doing this for a long time, and it's just a way for me to like see a story on Twitter. I'm like, oh. That either I read it, you know, enough to know it's going to be good for the show or think it might be good for the show. And if sometimes if I'm not sure, I'll put a question mark after that. But, you know, hashtag SN Weekly is where I collect all the tweets with possible stories for the upcoming week. Nice. And so anyone who wants to suggest a story, tweet it to us with the hashtag SN Weekly. And we will give it due consideration. So how, kind of speaking of that, uh, both with Twitter and with the blogs, uh, from your own viewpoints, how have you seen both the social networking and uh, kind of the, the internet journalism aspect of new music, how has that changed how we, in, how we uh, here I am, I'm losing, I'm like, I should, I, sh- I should be typing, I'm writing, I'm usually writing for this, uh, for this <laughs> column. I'm now speaking, and I'm like, you know, gibbering idiot. Um, but, ba- <laughs> but basically, how do you think that's changed how folks in the new music community have uh, or, or are, are able to not only find out what's going on, but also uh, interpret what's going on? Dave? Well, well I mean... <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Uh, <laughs> You know, before before I started reading the uh, new music box has been around. Right. They've been around the block. And I, I I think New Music Box was probably around when I went to college the first time before I even started mm-hmm. studying composition. Um so they've always been a place that I've found because I've I've always been a geeky person that would search for information about things on the web. Um but it's really hard to find information about this kind of niche performance things. Um, you know, performances obviously are evanescent. They go away and they're in the kinds of performances that we give involve six people performing. And if you're lucky, at least six people in the audience. Um, so it's hard otherwise to find out just what's going on. Um, and, we absolutely could not do this show without New Music Box and Sequenza 21 and An Overgrown Path and uh, Rest is Noise blog and the New York Times blogs. You know, we couldn't do this show. We wouldn't. And, and the reason we couldn't do the show is because we wouldn't know anything <laughs> about any right. of the people or places that we're talking about. Right. Without without reading the, the New York Times and without reading the New Music blogs, we wouldn't know what Le Poisson Rouge was. That wouldn't mean anything to us, nor would we know half of the composers that we talk about on a weekly basis. Um, right. And I do, I do think that's important. That's the fact that you guys are, I mean, at least uh, some of you are in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the fact that you're able to talk intelligently about all of these things that are happening either in Los Angeles or in New York or in Chicago or, or Europe, wherever, um, it's really kind of opened up uh, the the discussion to not just the few that are in the know, but pretty much anyone, yeah. if they want to get into the discussion. And and like you said, that's the, that's a key thing is to get into the discussion. Mm-hmm. The, the great thing about blogs is that you can respond to them, mm-hmm. and uh, right. you can you can be a part <laughs> of a conversation. Rob it's, knows it's a a pla- you mean people can comment on blogs? <laughs> I I have read this, and I don't know if you have noticed that sometimes people comment on the things that you write, Rob. Um. Every once in a while. <laughs> Which I must admit has been, uh, you know, from my own standpoint, it really has changed uh, how I how I look at what I'm doing right now. Um, a year ago, pretty much the whole first year of my stint at New Music Box, I was basically talking about the interviews that I've been doing for this book project, which has been going on for two years and probably will go on for another two years. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I've branched off into new subjects and things that are a little bit more outside of, of that very specific slice of what I was talking about, 
um, yeah, you, you, it's very easy to kind of wander into areas where you're like, oh goodness, people have very, very strong opinions about, you know, this, that, or the other thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. interesting to be able to, to find that out without necessarily planning about it. Right. Yeah. And it's funny how the same names keep popping up in the comments section of oh, sure. certain articles too. I mean, you get to know these people if you haven't met them. I mean, most of the times you will meet them just because people travel around to the, mm -hmm. the as I think it was Du Yun who yeah. told me the new music new music community is a bit incestuous. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a funny way to put it, but it's oh, true. Sure. Well I'm sure that most most communities are like that in some form or fashion. We're just well, a little bit smaller than others. Yeah, and the <laughs> internet has certainly helped too with that. Like it, everything, like what we've been saying of everything being so small, like that <laughs> commenting on each other's writing to be able to like then maybe go see a show in New York, have yeah. a direct connection in that way. It's really neat to me. I don't know. Something that I think yeah. has has changed some, and not just for new music, but across the board. And I'm I'm really an advocate of it changing more. In new music is, you know, there. You can look at it this way. Several years ago, when uh, there wasn't as much information from lots of different places in the United States being disseminated, and it's still this way now, but you might get the impression that anything that has to do with new music only happens in L.A. or New York. Right. Um, I think you could make the argument that the only place media about new music is dispersed from is Los Angeles or New York. That doesn't mean there's not all kinds of new music concerts happening all over the country all the time. Um, and I think the ability that we have now to be more connected, and I'm, I'm not saying I know how to make it happen, although I gripe about it on the show all the time. You know, it's not just New York and L.A., it's everywhere. And, and we need to get people who are interested in new music talking to not just you know, the people in New York, but to, to everybody who's interested in that. Um, to me, that would be a good thing. Now, well, that doesn't mean New York still isn't a very important place. It is. But, you know, it, if there's a weirdo new music concert at, in New York, it's not like 60,000 people are there, you right, know. Right, right, it's, it's It's a little weirdo new music concert the same way it is if it were in Ochre Patch, Missouri. You know, it doesn't matter. That, that music has a limited appeal no matter where it happens. Well, and I was going to mention, uh, you know, a perfect example of that is Anne Majette who you mentioned that hopefully you're going to be able to bring on your show, which would be awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact that she is one of the most vocal arts critics in a national newspaper that's outside of either New York or Los Angeles, and the fact that both Washington and Baltimore are that whole uh, region is one of the biggest growing new music scenes uh, in the country. It, it really does show that that can happen elsewhere outside of those really big metropolises. Right. My favorite and, and, thing is just and, finding new or like having hearing about concerts that are happening that seem to have really interesting programs, but just hearing about it on Facebook and mm -hmm. like not, not having any connection with where it's happening, but like seeing that the stuff is happening and then later seeing a video of it on YouTube is like... <laughs> Right. That, that's happened a couple of times and it's like, it's the most brilliant thing. And yeah. And so it doesn't even, or for me in my not traveling bad habits that it doesn't even matter where it is. I can still experience it and comment and communicate with the people who make it directly, but just, yeah, through this technology instead. Well, yeah. I must admit one of the, one of the times that I was in New York city doing, doing some of my interviews, I was able to have breakfast with Patrick. <laughs> uh, which was so funny because I'm like, you know, I'd been, you know, we'd talked with each other a couple times online through, through your show mm -hmm. and then to actually sit down with, with this person and, and, and be able to talk over breakfast a real is boy. kind of, I, exactly. It's, it's, it is, it is odd. And I think the more and more people are meeting folks virtually online or through, through uh, mm -hmm. Twitter or through, um, Facebook, it's making those connections that much easier. Yeah. Right. No, yeah, absolutely. I've gone to a, I was at a Twitter new music meetup <laughs> with a couple of people once. It was great. All people who care about new music, we just met at a bar in New York. Miranay was there. Hmm. We had a few drinks. It was great. And Miranay's from Miranay San Francisco. I didn't know you gotten to meet Miranay in person. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. It was cool. Yeah, so I mean, like, it, you know, it, that's the good thing about New York, though. I mean, say say what you want about, you know, 
of course, new music needs to be everywhere, but I mean, New York's just a great place to beat up, and there's certainly a lot going on in terms of uh, performances you all mean the time. In, in the city, Patrick? <laughs> oh, yeah. The cool people call it the city. In no, the no, the city. city The city is Manhattan. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. So, yeah. so, We're not even cool, to get, I, cool enough listen, to get it I, right. You're not, you're not cool enough. Just You stop now. So Thanks. I live in Brooklyn. Stop now. Speaking of uh, technology shrinking our world and making connections, I'm going to – I have something to say about that, but also a short plug. Um, one area that I, I think everybody on the panel is just starting to realize that we don't know enough about because we found some cool music is from the U.K. and Europe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've started like last – this last episode, what was it, Tansy Davies? Tansy Davies. Davies. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, Tansy Davies, sure. Really interesting music, and so I, I think that's another avenue that I really want to work on is is creating a lot more contacts with uh, European and, and and Asian. Although you're more likely, I guess, probably to run into a language barrier when you start getting into Asia. Yeah, right. But you know, as much as we can, I'd like to start going more global and learning what more what's out there. And, and as hard as we try to talk to new and interesting people every week, we are in, in not. I don't think just the four of us that do the show, but we as uh, American new music community are shockingly ignorant of what's going on in the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah. So. I I would I would not only agree with that, but I would put myself up as the poster child of folks who, <laughs> right. who are uh, <laughs> ignorant of of things that are out there. So yeah. I I totally agree. And the and the magic of uh, Skype lets folks call in from pretty much anywhere. Yeah, yeah. we've had a, yeah, that- at least one, maybe two guests from the UK. Mm-hmm. We had right? Gary Andrew. Um, Carrie Andrew was actually sort of, it was right around the time when you uh, wrote your women com- woman composer right. blog post. Yep. So that was kind of, that whole idea was flying around. And Carrie Andrew is a performer and composer who also writes for The Guardian. And uh, I just wrote her, that was our first cross the pond, I think. <laughs> trip. I think so. And I just wrote her an email and she was like, oh, of course I'll be on there. And, you know, we've gotten, that's helped us, you know, get our toe dug into the, I guess, the Twitter sphere in Europe a little bit. Because she's very active in that way. But right. uh, my short plug is for non-classical. It's a, a label in the UK, and it's uh, I haven't heard anything from them that I didn't like yet. So you should check it out. Very cool. So uh, kind of a, a big-ticket question for you guys. What about the new music scene today really interests you? And kind of each one of you individually, because I'm sure you, each of one of you have... Uh, kind of varied tastes, but what about what's going on today in new music really um, gets you excited? Hmm. I'll start as a publicist, I guess. Okay. Go Go for it. So I think the idea that there have been, there's a new generation, I guess I would say the indie classical scene for, for lack of a better term. I know there are a bunch of people who hate that, but I think we need we need something like that to sell it to people. Um, the, the idea that this is new music, this is new music, this is new music, and, and that there is no that it just transcends, you know, a, a specific generation, like like um, like classical music in general does. I mean, we need there was minimalism, there was modernism, and, and we need something for today. Even as even as diverse as all that music is, I think it's good that we. Are trying to find a way to describe what today's music is, and which I think a lot of what this recent Sonic Festival was about last year, when it said there's music from this decade, you know, it's a presentation of what's happening now, and I think we really need a a way to describe it. And I'm seeing a lot more people kind of embracing this idea of this generation of music, and I honestly think it's it's easier to talk about with people. So I th- I think that's a onward and upward I should say. Okay. I've got it. Okay, hit it, Sam. Um, it's sort of in in line in some ways, but sort of c- c- goes against what Patrick thinks about it. Uh, mm-hmm. To me, um, what's interesting about new music right now is that you don't have to overcome, even though I complain about this constantly, you don't have to overcome as much dogma with your music. You know, uh, John Cage is sort of, you could make the argument he's very well known and based his career off of like being a successful composer and looking out there and going, no, 
You know, I don't want to do that stuff. You know, I want to do something else. And so he overcame a lot of dogma. You don't have to be John Cage to overcome dogma anymore. Overcoming dogma is sort of like par for the course to the point where they're, they're getting to be almost no dogma, you know, and I like that. So uh, such that you can hear um, just about anything in the new music world. You know, you can hear Corey Dargle. Well, it sounds almost sort of like dance music except for the fact that it's speeding up and slowing down and <laughs> and and then you can still hear you know something that sounds more academic but cool like some sort of microtonal um string quartet <clears throat> and uh it's not like um you're not having to prove to somebody that the very idea of what you're doing is valid sort of everybody uh, you can do whatever you want and it's based and it's evaluated on its merits right there, not how it stacks up against anything, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm going to jump in and kind of along those same lines. Uh, the Just the fact that anybody can do anything uh, right now is, is really exciting in a way that I don't think was the case even five years ago. Um, that anybody, there, I mean, we see a lot of composer performers that um, play their own music, like Sam mentioned, Corey Dargle, um, and and then there are a lot of these kind of collectives between performers and composers. Uh, we've we've uh, Patrick earlier mentioned Ju Yun mm. and uh, Ice, and you know we've talked about Ice Lab on the show before, and they're certainly not the only project like that. And the fact that musicians, composers, and performers, and composer slash performer composer slash performers are just doing all these things for themselves um if you want to go and start a concert series it's really easy to do that it's really easy to get the word out about your concert series to people that would be interested and it's it's not free but it's very very cheap um mm -hmm. and it's it's something that's available to almost everyone if you want to start a record label you can start a record label and and you can sell your music on the web to anybody that's anywhere on the planet with a web connection um and like sam said you can create any kind of music that you want there's there's no uh stigma at least in a any universal way about any particular style of music and people are listening to as much music today as they've ever listened to before. Yeah, I think sort of what I would characterize part of what Dave said as I'm excited in new music about a lot of the things that I would also be excited for, you know, anything else. Uh, it's the, it's so easy to create infrastructure and get things done in a way that if you go back 20 years, you're talking about I could sit here and accomplish something on an infrastructure basis about organizing a group of people and, and aggregating all this effort from a bunch of people that 20 years ago you would have to be a large corporation to be able right, to right. do that that is a bigger deal than i think people give it credit for i mean just this show just doing this show uh, only a few years ago would have required us to live in the same city have a building have about three million dollars worth of equipment in that building and actually know what we're doing. <laughs> and today, uh, we just decided one day to put together this video podcast. And we started doing that. And we've been doing it for a year. And we've learned a lot doing it. But when we started, we didn't know anything. And we didn't spend any money on it. Right. So. Nate? Nate, you want to chime in? I love making Nate talk. <laughs> Got a bad mic cable, sorry. No excuses. Yeah, but I no. <laughs> well, I mean, so I often have been feeling younger and younger as I um, get exposed to more, and that's the the thing that has been changing for me so much in the last, uh, especially a couple years of just seeing the stuff that's out there, and then seeing people document their stuff so much better and so much th more thoroughly mm -hmm. uh, that like, I mean, I can, I, so I, I fancy myself a performer composer and I have a really hard time letting either of those go. And, uh, and like, I thought I knew a lot when I was in school and now I'm, I've been listening so much more since then. And like, we talk about uh, the level of access a lot in, <coughs> in classical music 
of like like it's it's been in the recent past a real negative of talking about music like that's really accessible or whatever <laughs> and and not so academic or whatever and so and now that's not such a big deal uh, with all the DIY culture and the indie, indie classical stuff but then literally things actually just being easier to get right um and easier to listen to and then having the artist's explanation of what they're doing and having that conversation so accessible literally <laughs> is just really brilliant to me i feel like i've been learning so much so quickly that it, and there's just like so much that i could just gobble up <laughs> and yeah uh, it, it inspires me to, to write and to practice and l learn all the things that i see and like and one makes me want to go to concerts too which i hadn't been doing for a long time yeah, I think uh, with people like sort of putting their artistic identity out there in an online format, which has been happening a lot more and more with, you know, any kind of identity. But um, something I find refreshing is people are not as worried about making sure everything that the public might see is sharpened to the razor point that, you know, mm -hmm. the razor point, you know, no one here has ever, has never written a bad note or anything, you know, and, and I think it's interesting, like on Corey Dargle's website, for instance, he's got some video projects on there and some of them are a couple of years old and they look, you know, like initial efforts at something. And that doesn't make me think, oh, he shouldn't have put that out there. Look at the production quality of that, blah, blah, blah. That makes me think that's awesome because I can look at this other thing he's got up there that's a video project that's from later, and I can see the progress, and it, it lets me identify with him a lot more as an artist rather than just tr forcing me to try and identify with whatever completely meticulously manicured pieces he's decided to put out. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people just really, really... Show, expressing themselves and being the people that they are out there. right but it, mm -hmm. so sam in your view you're you're ex you're consuming all of this as the artist though what if there are people who aren't <laughs> artists but they just still like um you know looking at pro video projects like that or something and like maybe they can't in their own experiences really relate to that they just want to consume stuff i'll take the punch for sam here i think one of the interesting things about the uh the conversation that we're all a part of is that we're a part of a very large conversation and that that conversation is, I think, really pleasantly candid most of the time. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we're doing this to impress anybody. Um, and and it, it's really wonderful when I, when I hear our conversation and, and read the stories that we read to, to prepare for the show, just how straightforward everyone is. Mm -hmm. It's not... Nobody's talking about anything we're doing like it's alchemy. You know, we're <laughs> right. just regular people making things. Hanging out. Right. I mean, and, not, I mean, that's, not that's this podcast. Of... I mean, as composers, we're mm -hmm. just regular people making right. things. Right. And that's what I wanted to... I mean, that was my follow-up, basically, is that, I mean, everyone... Sam, Sam is right in the fact that, you know, everyone should be a part of the conversation and can be a part of the conversation. And this yeah. is just an example of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think some of that has to do with just the mindset. Um, I know that it's hard for any of us until you actually dip your toe into the pond, so to speak. Um, it's hard for us to even think about. Oh well, yeah, I could you know, write you know write a comment on that blog or you know watch your show and then send in something uh, and and switch from being a passive. Uh, participant to an active participant in the conversation and I think hopefully more and more over the next few years more folks especially from other parts of the country uh, because I know they're reading stuff and I know they're watching this stuff but they're just not getting involved in the conversation hopefully shows like yours will get them interested uh, not only interested but also showing that they too can get into the conversation and find their own way of doing that yeah, you know, uh, wait until the people who are in undergraduate composition programs right now are, you know, 15 years out of their degree. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, for, for them, all this tech stuff is going to be way more commonplace. Although I will say that, that Dave and I have started a legacy at Michigan State. Um, we started <laughs> webcasting uh, composer concerts there and built the website and all this stuff. And there's been a concerted effort among the people that are still there now to keep that going. Good. Um, which I think is good. 
Yeah. Um, so, so something I found that's really funny, and I thought about this at work, and I remembered I had thought about this early on. This is from April 25, uh, 2011. Uh, Steve Layton of Se- Sequenza 21 calls us reasonably smart. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Here we go. Sound Not Notion that. is a reasonably smart, witty, casual place to catch up with concerns and up-and-coming composers figuring out this music world today. You know what? You know what? He's right. He <laughs> I'll take it, yeah. I'll take reasonably smart. <laughs> it's much better than reasonably dumb. Yes. <laughs> I think that's a quote that could go on your phone. <laughs> that's, your that's my poll quote for my website. Yeah. <laughs> Not reasonably dumb. Yeah. <laughs> Although you could put in a little comma there. Reasonably and smart. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, couple, couple uh, finishing questions. Who else would you like to interview? Oh, Ooh, that's a, We've gotten through a good well, deal of our dream list. Yeah. Yeah. Alex Ross was certainly on our dream list. Uh, Alex, a- Alex Ross and Alan Pearson were, were big, no. were big deals for us. Yeah. Uh, Hillary Hahn Jeremy has been Dank. doing some really interesting things lately. Yeah. It'd be awesome to talk to her. I'm working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Trust me. I, I am. This, this, we'll talk later. <laughs> I have a, I have a dream guest and, and maybe this will, this will, I've been considering how to phrase an email to this guy to get him on the show. Um, Anybody who watches the show know that I will harp. Dave will say when I go off on a hippie tangent where I'm like, you know, what good does this do for society? And that kind of question, you know, <laughs> um, you know, and we're talking about new music all the time. And, and I put forth the idea that any way of squirreling with rhythm or squirreling with pitch and how you're going to select your pitches and how they're combined, you know, anything you can think of from mathematical computation to pure chance has been tried, you know? Um, and so one of the ways I sp- postulate that music can be made more new is figuring out um new ways to use that music and new ways that that music can connect people and that kind of thing which is sort of a you know a hard thing to grab hold of and and i would love to get bill ivy who was one of the national endowment for the arts under bill clinton and since then has gone on to do lots of cool things and has lots of great ideas about uh how to more uh intelligently spend arts funding um, in the United States. And I would love to get him on the show and, you know, wedge him in with the idea of new music, you know, mm-hmm. and, and get his thoughts where you force him to filter his ideas through the idea of new music. Cause I just can't imagine that good things wouldn't happen. You know, I, I would you. like to continue to get new perspectives on the new music community. We get mostly composers on the show. I want to continue to try really hard to get performers on the show who are doing a lot of new music. Able. Um, and just in, in general, get people who are on in all parts of this ecosystem of, of music. Uh, you know, that's one of the reasons we get really, we have a good time talking to Drew McManus. Uh, because he's he's a part of the the community of making classical music that we don't often think about, and you um, feel smarter after you talk to Drew. That's right. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, so th- yeah. people like that, and people like Bill Ivy that, that Sam mentioned, that are maybe the the less obvious members of, uh, of but but still vital members of a really thriving ecosystem. You know, it'd yeah. be a great conversation. Hmm. Rocco Landisman. Yes. Mm, yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh. Leave oh. the torches and pitchforks at home, that gentleman. <laughs> How awesome would that be? That'd be such a great That'd conversation. Fun. That'd be fun. I have another another dream guest, actually, and I've mentioned this to Dave, and I'm still figuring out the best way to word an email to convince them is uh, when we had, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank, piano, uh, Sondheim piano pieces. Um, uh, Anthony oh, DeMar. Anthony DeMar. Um, he had a piece by the, the pianist for the bad plus. Oh yeah. I oh yeah. <laughs> to have the bad plus on the show or some members of the bad plus. Cause when you, you know, they're definitely a jazz trio, but when you listen to their music and I would, you can watch their entire live at the village Vanguard from like 2000, you know, early ish two thousands. Um, and it's like a concert in a, you know, <laughs> a concert hall kind of experience and the pieces while there's certainly improv improvisation going on they're they're very much through composed in a lot of ways and they actually play at new music festivals too so mm-hmm. it's not just me that is thinking they qualify 
and someone who's been able to, you know, uh, sort of cross pollinate themselves from a jazz trio to be considered new music. You know, that to me is very interesting and I would love to get them on the show. Uh, yeah. Another programming thing that I want to do is to have more uh, kind of one off special event kind of things i we we've we talked to drew about this after the show yesterday and we talked to him about it before is to to have kind of like a one-time panel discussion where it's not the four of us it's maybe one of us or none of us and we put, bring together three or four people who all we think could help solve a problem that's facing our community um we've talked to drew about um putting together a panel discussion about the the role of composers in the orchestra business um mm -hmm. and that's something that he would be really interested in doing uh he told us so hopefully that's something we could do in, in the near future is have these kind of special topic panel discussions yeah we've we've nurtured a, a set of little ideas one Pet projects Pet, the one about um, that with Drew, we talked with uh, Alan Pearson about having one about programming, mm -hmm. um, and we've talked. We talked. Ken Ueno was interested. I suggested to him and other people about music composition education. Right. Like, right. Just there. I don't know how focused it would be, but we could determine that as we go. But I would love to do that one. Basically, we have a long wish list. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's it. Uh, not to not to sound too redundant, but like I said, the the fact that you guys are doing this under your own volition, you just came up with it and decided you didn't ask anyone, was it okay if we did this? You just did it. Um, there needs to be more of that, you know. We this, I mean, that's I think that's why we get along so well together, uh, because I've been doing the same damn thing for like about seven years now, and mm -hmm. and it's it's. It's fun, and more people need to take the reins and and not let just a few folks who happen to be writing for a particular newspaper, a particular magazine, or a particular website. Um, you know, even though I'm the one of the ones writing for a website, you're the one uh, percent. It, yeah, I am. Oh, trust me, I'm definitely not the one percent. Uh, but it's 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 just the idea that there needs to be more folks at least taking part in the discussion and coming up with these better uh, better ideas. Um, and it would be wonderful if we're able to figure out a way to kind of bring all of those disparate folks from from our 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 own community of new music journalism, if you want to call it that. That's a big um, that's a big scary word for us here at Sound Nation. Right, I, trust me, same here, uh, or whatever you want to call this, uh, you know, to try and put our heads together and figure out what we can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think keeping in the forefront of our mind, which you know. Uh, uh, you do write for a popular new music blog, but I would say that that you don't try to, um, you know, I don't think any of us are trying to hedge our opinion into being the predominant opinion. Um, you know, uh, I made the joke like, "What is new music these days?" and uh, and I flippantly said to somebody, "Whatever we say, it is." You know, but there's a <laughs> kernel of truth to that. You know, I mean, we're the only new music podcast, so in a certain sense, whatever we say is cool is cool. At least to whoever watches the show. Yeah, but in the world. we're the we're the only new music roundtable talk show. Audience. Yeah, I mean, there well, is we, a there is a. a who is it? Richard Zaru hosts No Extra Notes, which is a fantastic yeah. interview James podcast. Holt. My ears yeah. are open is great. Yeah, so we're more interested in starting a conversation and getting as many stakeholders involved in the conversation, and we think this is a way to start the conversation. Um, and speaking of James Holt, friend of the show, James Holt, mm -hmm. anyone who has trouble with the length of our show, he pointed out a very useful function <laughs> for absorbing our content. You can play the audio version of the show at double speed. In a lot of yes. podcast players. Yeah. In a lot of podcast plays. So we were informed that on the train to work, he listens to us at double speed, and that's how he's able to get the show in every week. Is it, is it just Sam going? <laughs> I sound like I'm at double speed already, don't I? And then me speaking at normal speed, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we put me, I end up at quadruple speed, and, and Nate gets brought up to normal speed. Nice. Exactly. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for meeting with me on, on this Monday evening. And, uh, of course, much good luck to you and and your show, and hopefully one of these days I'll be able to to switch back so you guys can talk to me about something. Oh sure, if anything, 
because sometime soon it's 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 let me tell you it's it's really really a lot of fun to be able to get on the show and then just to see where you guys take the different topics because it is really like a on a roller coaster because you have no idea you know because it's live and and there's no like okay let's do that over uh, it's just whatever happens happens, which is which is a hell of a lot of fun, and you don't get a chance to do that very often these days. Right. We actually um, will be talking about this and that and the other before the show starts, and it's a common occurrence for someone when Dave and I start bickering about something or whatever. Just for, they wait, wait, save it for the show. <laughs> just all of its conflicts before we actually start recording. Right. So we have as much fun as anybody who watches the show and probably a lot more. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again. And we'll take this video to a close and hope to see you guys again soon. Yeah, really well. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rob.